Hello, welcome back for another Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine. Happy to be with you here today, sponsored by Textron Systems. Textron Systems' Aerosonder unscrewed aircraft system was designed for expeditionary land and sea-based operations, building on the system 600,000-plus flight hours in the field. The hybrid quad variant offers vertical takeoff and landing capability and brings enhanced mission flexibility while maintaining a small footprint. Learn more at TextronSystems.com. Today we mark a sad centennial in the history of the Navy, the 100th anniversary of the U.S. Navy's greatest peacetime loss of ships, a destroyer squadron's deadly wreck at Honda Point on the California coast, what is today part of Vandenberg Air Force Base. The Honda Point disaster left a graphic reminder And at low tide, some of the wreckage can still be seen on that rugged and treacherous stretch. The tragedy also has left an enduring wake of controversy and mystery, with many still wondering how a professional Navy could have made such a horrific mistake. There would be court martials of a historic amount resulting from this. But as our guest today will point out, there may have been someone else at the heart of it all to discuss their wonderful article on the current wish of naval history. Our former Secretary of the Navy, Kenneth Braithwaite, and his co-author, Charles Robbins. Thank you for joining us, gentlemen. I should point out that Secretary Braithwaite, 77th Secretary of the Navy, was the first admiral to actually become confirmed SECNAV. So that's kind of unique in itself. He's also a former U.S. Ambassador to the Kingdom of Norway, and he began his career as a naval aviator. It's nice to see you again, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for joining us. Good to be with you, Eric. And Charles Robbins. His co-author is a former naval officer as well, and he's the author of the political thriller, The Accomplice, published by St. Martin's. And he's the author of three nonfiction books with U.S. Senators, including thanks, the U.S. Senate me. with former Majority Leader Tom Daschle. Gentlemen, uh, welcome. So let's discuss the Honda Point tragedy. Um, this kind of lives on as a legend in Navy lore, but now that it's the centennial, it's a really good time to give it a fresh look, I feel like. so. Why don't you um, sort of set the table for us, uh, one or the other of you, and just sort of set the stage for what quite occurred on that fateful day, 100 years ago. Sure, Mr. Secretary, would you would you like me to do that or shall I? Yeah, you can go ahead, Charles, go ahead. Okay, well, just the, uh, the nuts and bolts then. Um, Desron 11, Desquire, De- Destroyer Squadron 11 on uh, September 8th, 20, uh, 1923 was making what, what what should have been a pretty routine run from San Francisco to its home port of San Diego, but a couple of factors made it a little bit less than, than routine. One is that um, post-World War I, uh, post-Washington Naval Conference, the, the, uh, the Navy was, was, was looking at drawdowns, significant drawdowns, and the uh, destroyer fleet, among others, felt um, obligated to prove its worth uh, to avoid uh, further mothballing. So to that extent, uh, orders were, were issued um, to make this run at 20 knots. And without digressing too much, there was a question whether the 20 knots was, um, was mandatory or optional. Until then, cruising speed had generally been 12 to 15. Um, Destroyer Squadron 11 under uh, Commodore Edward Watson, Captain Edward Watson, decided that the orders were mandatory. Furthermore, to maximize the, uh, or rather to minimize the speed to, uh, to try to set a record, they would hew pretty close to the, uh, to the Rocky California coast rather than going farther out into the ocean, which would be safer but would take longer. So uh, they, they go on their way. Uh, I should note that conditions were, uh, were not ideal, uh, partly uh, because of an earthquake a week before the, the, the great Tokyo earthquake that, among other things, left um, strong following seas. And this is important because um, uh, visibility was, was darn near non-existent after the first um, radio direction signal. So these guys... This squadron was operating on, um, don't worry, I won't take the whole podcast on this, but it's important to, to lay it out, I think. Um, they're operating largely on dead reckoning. And, um, and, and to be more specific, um, 
the squadron was being navigated by the captain of the flagship, the captain of the Delphi, a guy named Hunter, Commander Donald Hunter, Hunter, who had taught navigation. Um, it was actually five years, um, two years most recently in Annapolis, and then he had an earlier stint. And Hunter thought he was, um, with good reason, pretty good at this. And um, but he, he didn't see any. Uh, he didn't have great faith in these newfangled radio direction finder signals. Uh, these radio towers. So to cut to the chase, as it were, um, let's fast forward. Um, it's a two hundred. It's a four hundred and fifty mile trip, give or take. And halfway down is um, Santa Barbara Channel, where they need to um, turn left, turn port to avoid some Channel Islands. And um, Hunter was convinced that they had reached that point. They were ready to make their left turn, their 90 degree turn, 95 degree turn. But as it turns out, his navigation was off. Why was it off? Well, one reason is the strong following seas created um, swells that, that caused the vessels to broach. And when you're relying on dead reckoning, and it's going to become readily apparent if it isn't already that I am the junior guy in this conversation on naval navigation. Uh, you guys are being very gracious to me. But um, but my understanding is when the ships broach, all the calculations Hunter was doing for dead reckoning, calculating distance by by uh, propeller rotations was out the window because the rota there's not any any grab, any traction when the propellers are, are, are churning in air. So what should have been, in his mind, 21 um, miles per hour knots per hour was actually 19, which is significant because what it means is that they were nowhere near as far along in their journey. They were nowhere near near as long as far south as Hunter thought they would they were. And I'm going to conclude this agonizing summary with with this. Um, Hunter got a uh, a direction signal. It was actually a bearing, not a signal from Port Arguello, the nearest uh, radio direction. Um, station. And what it said was, essentially, you are northeast of us. And Hunter said, no, 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 no. You're wrong. The same way you were wrong earlier today, you guys are, he didn't say this, he didn't say you're worthless, but that was his, his point. These newfangled radio direction signals are worthless. Why? Because you're giving me the, the, the reciprocal, the wrong bearing, meaning uh, the radio, the bilateral compass, and if this is old hat to to you guys, forgive me, it was not to me. But the bilateral compass, which is, I, I think of it kind of like a tennis racket without um, strings, was the device the uh, radio station used to uh, fix a bearing, a signal any given ship would send a signal, a bunch of repetitive dashes. The, um, the station would turn its bilateral compass until the signal was strongest and voila, you have your bearing. The only problem is you don't know if it's which side of the antenna of the bilateral compass the, 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 the signal is coming from. Hunter said, you guys are wrong. You have me northeast. No, 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 no. I'm going much faster than you think. I'm already either southwest. He wasn't. So he turned left right into um, a uh, what was called the Devil's Jaw Honda Point, this ghastly um, run of volcanic rocks and wrecked the... Uh, squadron one after another they were in column formation regrets guys that was too long but that's that's the nuts and bolts of the uh, forensics of, of how that uh, fa fatal trip happened charlie that was great well done yeah. thank you for that charles <laughs> so basically a new technology and terrible weather conditions and a extremely treacherous coast i mean the fact that they've been calling it the devil's jaw all this time uh, a, a terrible place for this all to transpire Naturally, there's going to be an investigation, and they're going to try to get to the bottom of this. And uh, Secretary Braithwaite, while the investigation is just barely even getting underway, the Secretary of the Navy at the time did something a little bit sort of out of form, off protocol. And in a sense, he weighed in on it in a slightly judgmental way to the press. So why don't you tell us about the fairly colorful and unique Secretary of the Navy at the time? Well, this is a fascinating story, Eric, that I learned a long time ago. Um, I first read about it while I was a midshipman at Annapolis, and I was just always uh, taken by the story of the heroics. I mean, when you think about when these ships crashed onto the rocks, uh, one after another, uh, 
Um, it was dark. Uh, the waves were high. Um, a lot of them instantaneously lost all um, sight. Uh, you know, lights went out, immense flooding. And the amazing thing is the, uh, the, the courage, um, how these sailors rose to the occasion um, and overcame this kind of adversity um, and literally walked away from what should have been a much greater loss of life than really occurred. Um, but as I learned more about the story and I shared it with Charles years later when we worked together for uh, Senator Arlen Inspector. We're both fascinated by the backstory, which is almost uh, as compelling as the events in the water. And you touch on that. So Edwin Denby is the Secretary of the Navy. Um, he is a Republican uh, from Detroit, Michigan, uh, same neck of the woods that I hail from. And uh, he had an incredibly colorful background. Mostly um, he was um, not a frontline Michigan politician, that you would have thought would have been appointed to a cabinet level position. Remember, this is prior uh, to 1947. So the Secretary of the Navy uh, is a presidential cabinet level position, uh, not sub cabinet. So uh, Denby's going to report directly to uh, Warren G. Harding, the President of the United States. And he was the final cabinet pick, um, kind of uh, out of left field and unexpected. Um, but Denby uh, was never one who. Um, I mean, I don't want to disparage the man's character, but um, he, he always seemed to cut corners. Um, he sought um, uh, an appointment in the Marine Corps during World War I, um, which he secured um, first as an enlisted man and uh, eventually retired uh, or left the service uh, uh, because of some uh, physical issues. Uh, he was a very large man um, as a major, and uh, he was very proud of that. For the rest of his life, he wanted to be called major. Um, and, uh, and, and so he was, but anyway, uh, the way he got into the office and then in Washington, he was kind of a fish out of water. Uh, he was maybe a double a player in a major league arena and, uh, he couldn't really figure out, uh, you know, uh, what end was up to be very honest with you. And so he got himself embroiled in the famous teapot gun scandal, um, which was, uh, uh, coming to light just about the same time as this event. So Denby, uh, being the ever uh, endeavoring individual that he was, sought to redirect the attention off of himself after the tragedy event all the way until uh, he's eventually forced to resign. Um, and in one of his final acts, uh, he refuses the Navy's findings in a court of inquiry, uh, basically saying that the Navy wasn't hard enough on these individuals, all uh, basically to deflect the attention from himself uh, on to uh, other events that were occurring in the Navy, this being, of course, um, you know, the most uh, the most prominent. It was headline grabbing, yes. And the timing couldn't have been worse for him because, as you say, here he is already enmeshed in the Teapot Dome scandal. But also, if uh, Honda Point hadn't happened, he was going to come under fire, don't you think? Because there's a lot of grumblings about the state of the Navy at this point, and under his stewardship, it was the, the fleet was not in a very good place. Uh, there were a lot of uh, problems uh, that were coming to light. So, in a sense, Honda Point maybe gave him a focal point to deflect from that. Would you agree? No, oh, absolutely. You know, the Navy was drawing down after World War One, and then, as Charles mentioned, uh, the Washington uh, uh, Conference of 1922, the previous year, uh, saw additional limitations on the size of the fleet. Um, so, you know, we were, you know, in a downturn as far as uh, um, resources to support the Navy and the history of uh, our services, seeing that, you know, many times, uh, generally after uh, times of conflict, uh, the Navy tries to reorient itself and be in a position to meet the needs of the nation, uh, but they do so in a declining fashion. And this is, you know, uh, case in point was the story here. Mm -hmm. Um so I'm, I'm mystified. I invite either of you to address this. Um, why in the world did Warren Harding pick uh, Denby for Secretary of the Navy? He, he really does not seem like an obvious choice, as you indicate, in so many ways. May I give this one a shot? Yeah, please yeah, do. Um, what, I, what we read uh, in, uh, in research is that it was a recommendation from his uh, Secretary of War that, uh, as, as Secretary Braithwaite said, uh, 
this was the last cabinet pick, and it was uh, it was sort of uh, ripening and rotting on the vine. Really needed to pick somebody, and um, and Denby's name was suggested. And as we pointed out in the um, well, anyway, that's that's the that's the short, long and short of it. Hart Harding did not know Denby. Okay, so it was, it was the Secretary of War's recommendation because. Uh, yeah, it just seems like an odd choice, and uh, regardless of any of this other stuff, he seems like an odd choice. I mean, the fact he um, joined the Marine—I mean, in one hand, I read this and I think it's incredibly admirable. This guy gets into World War One, he joins the Marines. He's forty-seven, maybe. He's in his forties, yeah. two hundred and fifty-four pounds, and his physician tells him boot camp, Marine boot camp is going to kill you, but he insists right. on going through that way, and he makes a big point of like, I didn't seek a commission. I'm going to go from the ground up. Um, and then at the same time, here's a fellow who uh, is an amateur comedian and poet. Yeah. He's just a tough one to figure all around. So uh, he was well, definitely, it, it, you know, and he found himself, uh, you know, leading a professional Navy um, of naval officers who dedicated their lives to this profession um, without any background or without any knowledge. Um, and he struggled for that. All right. And uh, then, you know, in a situation like this where he passes judgment on an extremely well respected senior Navy captain, who, by the way, happened to be very close to the future chief of naval operations, William V.C. Pratt, uh, who was the judge of the court, um, you know, presiding member of the court of inquiry. Um, you know, it just <laughs> served to create a situation that was not in Denby's favor. So Denby continued to lose. Uh, respect amongst the professional naval officer corps, um, and then he lost uh, respect uh, with the media. The media took him to task, um, you know. And instead of, you know, joining forces as the secretary should be, as the leader, civilian leader of the department, um, you know, he set himself up against uh, the navy and literally besmirched some of those naval officers characters by suggesting to the media that these senior naval officers, including the CNO at the time, were keeping information from him. Um, and that just exposes yourself to, you know, again, that's why I said he was the double A player uh, playing, you know, in major mm -hmm. leagues and, and he wasn't up to the task, Eric. Um, right. And then, you know, to be convinced, um, you know, he was, um, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, Charles, I, I forget, Exactly, but he was exonerated from the Teapot Dome scandal. I mean, he kind of got uh, a lucky pass on that. Uh, it tarnished his reputation, but you know he was tricked into it uh, by the Secretary of Interior. Um, you know to go along with uh, this scandal, which saw Sinclair Oil used in the U.S. Naval Reserves, which then be willingly trans transferred over to the Department of the Interior. Um, you know, and he didn't do his dil dil due diligence uh, to work within you know government. Uh, uh, parameters to do what was right. Right. Uh, yeah, just if I may, I, uh, I mean, it's, it's really a brilliant encapsulation to call the guy a double A player. That sort of says it all. But um, I'm frankly uh, proud of this piece. I guess you saw fit to publish it, but in no small measure because I, I think it's a nuanced picture of a, a guy who was often parodied in the press. It was easy. Denby was, Eric, Mr. Mills, as you say, he was he was a little over six feet, six feet and a half inch. He was 247 pounds at his at his relatively trim induction weight into the Marines. He got to be, he was a lot heavier than that when he took the oath as Navy Navy Secretary. He was uh, corrupt. The line from um from Senator Thomas Walsh was, you are guilty of ignorance and stupidity worse than crime. It was a hapless life. Uh, for a guy who was uh, seem seemingly so successful, three terms in Congress, but um, but voted out of office. You know, who, I'm just uh, who am I to to criticize a guy who put in six years in the House of Representatives? But it's not easy to 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 um, kick somebody out of office to uh, to fire a congressman. That happens. Uh, he he's too clever by half on his finances, as we laid out. So he's uh, one step ahead of the. Um, Whoever it was back then, the guys with the um, in the white suits and the uh, and the big nets on that one, he's got health issues, um, understandably. And um, beyond um, beyond that, and we didn't go into detail on this because how much character analysis can you do in a, in a in a piece? But he was, if you will, the black sheep or the embarrassment in a uh, in a 
supremely distinguished family. His father, Charles Denby, had been minister to China, sort of equivalent. Um, I, I'll, I'll defer to the ambassador, Admiral, secretary there. But but I think that's that, that's kind of akin to ambassador, isn't it? Well, he, it he was. Um, and his brother, Charles, his older brother, was a distinguished, the preeminent China scholar. His younger brother, Garvin, was an entrepreneur, successful Detroit uh, automotive entrepreneur to the point that Edwin Denby worked for him. And all this is going on. All his uh, relatives, his father, his siblings are doing famously. And Denby is just sort of foundering from one gig to another. He's big. He's kind of loud. He's a blowhard. Um, and and, and I, I'm, I'd like to think that um, we collectively, the three of us, can take some pride in painting the guy in three dimensions. Which, which was not always um he, he didn't always get that right well the and press likes the easy <laughs> well it was it's a good one i mean but the press did like to have a nice big ripe target that he was constantly providing yeah. them and all these things we're talking about this complex individual that sort of make him an odd fit for this important cabinet position the one that struck me the most is like this really doesn't seem like a guy that fits as you note that he had a certain resentment toward navy officers mm -hmm. um i find that um both bizarre in this case and also quite uh intriguing fascinating he had a certain resentment toward navy officers and how can you be objective in that role if you have that encoded in you um you where do you think that came from that I that sort of well you know my understanding is, uh, you know, he believed that uh, um, that most of the Naval Officer Corps back then were Annapolis graduates. Um, and I believe he thought that most of those graduates um, held themselves to be, you know, of a higher class uh, than he did uh, of himself. And therefore, he had a chip on his shoulder before he ever walked in the door, to your point, Eric. And, and you can't lead with that kind of a perspective. <laughs> um, you know, everybody walks in and becomes part of any team based upon the skill sets that they provide to the overall organization or enterprise. And I'm sure Denby could have figured out how he could have been, you know, an additive uh, versus a detractor. But, you know, he chose the uh, he chose the latter. And, uh, you know, that played out routinely in a lot of decisions he made. There was one where I recall um, uh, the Postal Service was having some issues uh, with mail being stolen. And uh, he stood up in a blustery manner and ordered the Marine Corps, you know, to start riding the trains. Um, and he did so, you know, he, as a Secretary of the Navy, you don't do that. You go to the Commandant of the Marine Corps and you ask the Commandant, Commandant, I need you to step up and need you to, you know, resolve this. You let the Commandant step forward and be the one to order, uh, you know, the Marines in the And I believe the Commandant at the time was uh, John Lejeune. So, you know, again, uh, you know, he was in over his head and trying to make something out of something that wasn't. There's an, also an immense backstory to this, which plays out in the courtroom later. Um, and, uh, you know, it kind of gives you some insight in, uh, in, in some of the other elements that led to this tragedy. Um, one that's really interesting that, that Charles landed on is um, Watson had come from Japan. And uh, Japan at the time, of course, was an emerging uh, Far East nation, uh, kind of similar to situations here uh, that we find ourselves in the 21st century. Um, and they were becoming a, uh, a major military power in the Far East. And as such, Watson was fascinated uh, with uh, Japanese culture and uh, with this rising capability that the Japanese Navy um, was presenting. And uh, he just so happened the day before sailing, he bumped into the State Department's preeminent uh, subject matter expert on Japan, a guy by the name of Eugene Duman, and uh, he invited him to come along on the ship. So here you've got the State Department civilian who's really not supposed to be on board the ship. Um, he's on board the ship with Watson, and Watson spends most of his time, you know, in conversations with Duman. Um, instead of being on the bridge checking the, uh, you know, the nav plot, he's down there conversing and talking about uh, Japanese uh, military capabilities. Um, it's a fascinating side story. Duman kind of disappears from history. He slides out the back door. Charles did 
an amazing amount of research on this, uh, Eric. I mean, he went up to the uh, University of Michigan where Denby's papers are. He dealt with the National Archives, uh, Navy History and Heritage Command, digging into as much as we could find. Because, you know, as you know, we have this forthcoming uh, uh, novel that uh, yours truly has been, uh, has been <laughs> sitting on uh, with all my, all my other work. Um, but, but, you know, Charles lays out uh, a compelling story here. And there are a few characters like Watson who emerge. Again, he's very dear friends, uh, shipmates with the soon to be future CNO, William Veazey Pratt, who's got to draw a fine line between um, looking after his shipmate uh, as well as not getting on the wrong side of the Secretary of the Navy. Um, and then you've got, uh, you know, probably the greatest hero, a guy by the name of William Calhoun, who's the CEO of the Delphi. And, uh, you know, he uh, emerges um you know as uh as a real hero um and goes on to retire as a flag officer during uh world war ii mm -hmm. right well and if he hadn't been exonerated back then all that course of history would have changed um the way that he was so embittered that the um, officers were acquitted uh was just I was gobsmacked by that. I mean, how is that a public position for the Secretary of the Navy to take? Like, oh, it should have, we should have been hard. That should it was wrong. It should everything about him is sort of a, a PR nightmare. And I know that's not what drives anything really, but he did have a tin ear in those regards, and uh, that was the beginning of the end for him. I mean, that's when he stepped down. Correct after he after this verdict came down, and they were uh, they were let off. Uh, well. He, 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 and, and I correct myself, Calhoun was the CEO of the Young, not the Delphi. Delphi was Hunter's ship. That was the flagship. So I right. stand corrected. Um, but, um, you know, again, Denby, uh, he, he got out in front of his skis on this, um, trying to take a position and thinking that, you know, he had the complete authority to do so. Um, when the findings came to him, he was pretty much, uh, he had already announced his resignation. So as a lame duck, uh, you know, he disagreed with the findings, but, you know, he disappeared shortly thereafter. Um, and most everyone was exonerated, as you as you mentioned. Now, if he hadn't stepped down. Kind of interesting. What ifs to ponder? He was kind of kind of getting some hot water for the state of the Navy anyway, at this point. And it, it's interesting to wonder how his tenure as a secretary would have played out had he not sort of voluntarily stepped off the stage when he did. Um, what about that? What do you think? I mean, would he, would he have somehow grown into the role or was he going to um, sort of go down as like a bad choice sec nav in the end, one way or the other? I feel like he would have personally. Well, I, I, I would agree with you, Eric. I mean, uh, and again, you know, uh, the article that you published uh, in the latest issue of Navy, Naval History Magazine, um, you know, Charles and I took out our concluding paragraph because, you know, it's easy to play Monday morning armchair quarterback, you know, and disparage a man, you know, who made these decisions 100 years ago at a different time in our nation's history. But the bottom line to it all is the fact that, you know, he was in over his head. Um, you know, he had real, real problems in every single uh, hearing that he, had, uh, you know, was asked to testify in front of Congress. And uh, he was not aligned um, you know, with his uh, officer corps. Um, and, you know, to be, a, I think, uh, to be a successful secretary of the Navy, you have to figure out how you partner with the CNO um, and how you make that relationship work. And that was advice that was given to me by people like Admiral Mullen and Secretary Lehman and others who had gone before me said, you know, hey, Ken, if you want this to work, that needs to be a very, very close relationship. And Admiral Gilday and I are dear friends to this day, um, you know, predicated on that understanding. Sure, the, the civilian secretary is the overall one who, uh, you know, is in charge of the department. But it, it, as you learn in any organization, one person can't stand up and say, you know, I'm uh, the king here and everybody's going to follow exactly what I say. Um, you know, when you do that, you're going to run aground. You're going to run foul. Somehow, some way, the organization, the enterprise is going to un undermine you. And that's what I believe happened to Denby. When he alienated himself from the CNO and others, um, you know, he created that dynamic. So to your point, Eric, 
you know, had he continued to serve, which another thing that, you know, we uh, discovered is when uh, Harding died, um, Assistant Secretary of the Navy at the time was Teddy Roosevelt Jr. And uh, Roosevelt was very concerned about Denby's lifestyle. Um, and then Harding dies in office and Coolidge becomes president. And, you know, Coolidge was no fan of Denby's and could feel the heat coming from Congress. And again, to be an effective president, you have to work with both the Senate and the House. Um, and so Denby became a liability to President Coolidge. Um, you know, that became troublesome for him as well. So, again, I think uh, all the markers were there, which would lead one to believe that even if the uh, disaster at Honda Point had not occurred, Denby's tenure to secret as Secretary of the Navy uh, was probably limited. My question is, what does that say about the way Secretary Denby acquitted himself, no pun intended, on the Honda Point situation? You know, so Charles, you know where I feel and what I feel about this and where I stand. So my first CO was a guy by the name of uh, Tom Lynch, uh, later Superintendent of the Naval Academy, Admiral Tom Lynch, uh, to this day is one of my uh, dear friends and, uh, and mentors. And uh, Admiral Lynch taught us, uh, then Captain Lynch taught us that uh, any organization um, can be summed up in ship, shipmate self. In other words, if you are not focused on the success of the enterprise and you're only thinking about yourself, or you're looking out for you and your shipmate, um, you're not placing the, the, the importance in the hierarchy that it needs to because, you know, and it's pretty easy to use this metaphor in the Navy because if the ship sinks, we all go down, right? So we should all be focused um, on the ship first. And I use this in a lot of my leadership talks uh, around the globe, Eric. I, I mean, I've boiled it down to the simplicity of putting the enterprise first. I mean, I, I just uh, had the opportunity to work with Silicon Valley Bank and when the whole bank went down, Everybody lost their jobs. Um, again, you put the enterprise first. You put the ship first. Well, Denby clearly did not do that. Denby was all about himself. He was all about, you know, being a politician first um, and not being an administrator as the secretary of the Navy. Um, you need to check all your politics and ego at the door. I mean, I, I've told many people as during my service as secretary, you know, I didn't look at myself as a Republican Secretary of the Navy, I looked at myself as a Secretary of the Navy in the long history of secretaries that had gone before me. And many of those who had served in Democratic administrations like Secretary Danzig became dear friends to me and gave me good advice and, and gave me some sailing directions, some rudder steer. Um, and so I, I believe that is where one of the reasons why Denby kind of got off track. Um, he forgot about what was most important. I think he thought this was going to be a dream job for him, but just didn't understand any of these things you're talking about, how this kind of basic stuff works. Um, oh, let me tell you. That's Washington, the impression you so, get. When you did. Yeah, well, absolutely. And having had the opportunity to, to work with Charles uh, way back uh, when we were young pups working on the Hill, I mean, you <laughs> learn a lot, you know, more than what you learn in civics books about how, you know, government in Washington, D.C. really works. And mm -hmm. you better be sitting there taking it all in and learning. Um, you know, because eventually when you get to a role of responsibility, you better have that understanding and you better be able to, you know, I'll never forget. I had one U.S. senator uh, who I'm, I won't mention who that was, but, you know, he literally pointed right at me and he said, look, I'll support you. But this is what I want. Um, and this is what you're going to do for me. Um, and, you know, it's like, OK, well, I'm at a moment in time here where I've got to get through confirmation to become the secretary of the Navy. Um, and look, at I, I live here in Philadelphia. I mean, this is uh, a horse trading uh, town if there ever was one. And, uh, you know, that's how some things get done. Um, and we kind of forget about that. Um, but again, it, it crosses all politics, not just, you know, one party or the other. But uh, that's how things get done in Washington. And you need to understand that when you go into it. Um, you, you never compromise your, your morals, principles and your ethics. Um, you know, but you got to be willing to work within the system to get the things that you need. If we need more ships, if I need more money to, you know, improve our shipyards and, you know, same thing with, with Carlos now, he's got to be able to reach across the aisle and work, you know, in a bipartisan manner to get that done. And Carlos has done a great job in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, these are, amen to all you said, your lips to God's ears on all that. Um, and one of the takeaways from this is 
uh, how things can happen at sea or on the coast, on the rocky coast, that nobody planned on or predicted or hoped for. And there's always a confluence of reason. Um, but what happens after that? It should be a clear cut, just objective, get to the bottom of it. Uh, politics shouldn't play into that. Egos shouldn't play into that. And this is a casebook study of how they did. And um, if, there, if there are any takeaways from this disaster, that would be one of them, that cautionary tale. Um, now, I understand you all have a more long form piece you're working on, on the Honda Point tragedy. You, you, you alluded to it earlier. You want to talk, do you care to talk about that any or give it a mention? Charles, or? here it is, right here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we are um, we are working on a, a novel. I uh, have a, a, a very rough first draft. I, um, as you noticed, the secretary is extraordinarily gracious to me. Um, Charles was able to do a lot of this research because the secretary <laughs> told him what to read and, and where to what doors to knock on. But uh, but true. we have a a novel in the works, and um, part of the um, on, on Honda Point, featuring, you know, shockingly, among other characters, uh, Secretary Denby, because um, it is such a rich story in, uh, in so many ways, um, both the, um, the operational and, and the characters. It's kind of um, what it's looking like is, um, I, I would say modern day, it's actually earlier, kind of um, uh, Kane Mutiny meets, um, I'm not sure what, uh, elements like that, but um, but if if I may just uh, feed uh, the secretary one more bit that's integral both to the novel and to um, to the magazine article, uh, Eric, you just you, it's a little late to ask if I can call you by your first name, um, but you you just uh, talked about um, essentially honesty uh, accounting, and that was one more overarching point. It's overarching in our novel, and it's also overarching in the Honda tragedy that and I'm going to give this a turn that you yield the floor in just a moment. But the point the secretary made to me was that Honda point is relevant, is instructional today because of lessons learned, but those lessons cannot be learned unless there's an honest accounting. And this is to your point, Eric, Mr. Mills, about what happens after the event, what happens with the judicial proceedings and the accounting. You can't learn the lessons unless there's an honest accounting and without digressing too much. Um, as your earlier, as Naval History Magazine's earlier piece noted, uh, the testimony, sworn testimony from Mr. Hunter and, and, and Delphi navigator, Mr. Blodgett, as the author put it, we now know was not, um, pick a nice diplomatic word, was not accurate. Um, but that is integral. Uh, Truthful. Mr. Secretary, do you mind if I throw you that one? No, oh, you know, absolutely, Charles. I mean, um, you know, again, if you're looking uh, for an example of how not to lead, um, of how not to um, set the right um, course, if you will, uh, for those entrusted your leadership, there are a lot of lessons learned um, in this story, uh, you know, right from the very beginning. I mean, Watson had a responsibility uh, that he neglected. Um, he delegated. Well, if you decide as the Commodore, as the commander, as the Secretary of the Navy to delegate, you better be sure and understand who you're delegating to. I remember being a midshipman at the Naval Academy, uh, learning this lesson the hard way, uh, because to me, it didn't make sense that the commanding officer is ultimately responsible for the ship. Um, that, you know, we were, I it was a Belknap, Belknap uh, uh, collision that we were uh, being taught this day. And I kept coming back and asking this Lieutenant Commander, that just doesn't make sense, sir. So the commanding officer is in his stateroom, he's sleeping, you know, and some knucklehead uh, JG, you know, runs the ship into another ship. You know, why should the commander, you know, be held uh, accountable? And, you know, a after I questioned him, you know, a couple of times, he finally told me that if I didn't learn this lesson by the end of class, that I should tender my letter of resignation as a midshipman because, you know, this was uh, sacrosanct, central, you know, mm -hmm. to what it was to be a U.S. Naval officer. And, you know, that goes all the way up the chain. So, you know, you have to have that, uh, you know, uh, as your North Star guiding you. Um, and there are all kinds of lessons in this um, where that wasn't uh, the case and point. And to be very honest, if 
you know, we were looking back in history and it's always hard to go back and again, play Monday morning quarterback, put yourself in the seat. Um, you know, the Navy did not do a good job in this investigation. And there was some shipmate loyalty that played into some of the decisions that were made and recommendations coming out of uh, the court of inquiry um, and didn't really push upon, uh, you know, some of those uh, aforementioned as, as Charles was indicating, um, were not held accountable. Um, sure, uh, Watson never made flag officer. He was destined to be a flag officer. He had the pedigree, the background, the friends, um, you know, a promotion board would have easily promoted him to a flag officer in the not too distant future from the roles and jobs he had and the success he had up to this point. Um, but he was uh, reduced in number um, and literally that, you know, pretty much ended his career. Um, you know, those that uh, were uh, so affected, they continue to serve, uh, although, you know, did not uh, achieve the levels um, that they probably would have had this uh, event not occurred. The interesting one's Calhoun. He went on to uh, become a very successful naval officer during the Second World War, and uh, he retired as a four-star admiral. Um, and, you know, what he did, uh, you know, the, the uh, heroics that played out under his leadership, the young being the destroyer that was most effective with the greatest loss of life, he still came out as the great leader that he was, and history has now reflected that, uh, you know, in, uh, in his career. So, um, you know, a lot of things. I think about readiness. I think about, you know, the ship collisions that we had uh, recently in the Navy. Uh, mm -hmm. And their lasting effect even to today, you know, Admiral Gilday and I talked a lot about that, that, you know, we had a responsibility to make sure that our sailors were being trained and given the op opportunity, um, you know, to be prepared. Um, you can't send a sailor out to sea, um, you know, aboard a ship that's as complex a platform to operate uh, or in an airplane or in a submarine uh, without giving them that kind of uh, those tools and that type of training. Um, and that's something that, you know, again, these lessons that the Navy has learned over the years, hope can guide those who will lead in the future so that they understand the potential pitfalls by not doing, you know, the things that need to be done in order to maintain the fleet at sea. Well said, damn well said. And I think that reading about on the point uh, on the occasion of its centennial is a good place to start with those kind of lessons. And um, I commend you all for a wonderful article on. Um, it gives a real sort of a nuanced look at this uh, complicated event. And um, if you haven't read it yet, folks, uh, I highly recommend it. And you should definitely get out there and get a copy and read it. And I wish you all success with this book. I can't wait to see how it takes shape. Um, I know you're, you're busy individuals and uh, that can sometimes get in the way of the creative uh, process, but it's, it'll be great to see it when it comes out. And, um, well, wow, I certainly thank you for joining me today. This is a, it's wonderful to be able to do this kind of talk when there's um, an anniversarial occasion to do it. Uh, it. It lends a certain resonance to it that it otherwise wouldn't have, I feel. So thank you for making that happen. And thank you for the wonderful contribution to the magazine uh, that can be found in the current pages of it. Um, and best of wishes oh. to both of you. It's a pleasure thank talking you. with you. Bert. Thank you for having me. Um, Always a pleasure. Well, I hope we'll see you again sometime with something else you're uh, working on. We'll be here. Um, I guess that's it for today for us, folks. Uh, thank you for joining us for another Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Eric Mills. Until next time, fare thee well. <laughs>